This is Fresh Tracks Weekly. It is June. Time is flying by. It feels crazy. Uh, Memorial Day last weekend. Very grateful for those who gave their lives for our country. It's always good to take a minute and just realize how lucky we really are to be able to go outside and do the things that we love to do. Um, a lot of people gave their lives in order for us to be able to live so freely. And we enjoyed our long weekend. We had a three day weekend. Karen and myself took the opportunity to go on a turkey meat acquisition trip. It wasn't as much of a hunt as it was just uh, finding turkeys in vulnerable spot and stock locations and just sneaking up on them. It was all public land still, but uh, we just waited until we saw turkeys that were in a good spot to sneak up on, popped up over a rise and shot them. We never put on a piece of camouflage. Uh, we ended up with three turkeys and add a little variety to our protein consumption for this year. Um, it's definitely not as cool as, you know, calling them in and watching them come in full strut, but they weren't really gobbling that much, and I really like eating turkey, and the season ended in two days, so, yeah, that's what we did. But anyway, Dale was out solo hunting slash filming his bear hunt. I uh, just got back from a four-day solo mission of hunting for bears. I'm actually editing it right now. You guys are going to see it soon. Overall, it was a great hunt. Um, I had a lot of fun doing solo trip. It was supposed to be a solo trip, but things happen. So, um, saw quite a few bears. <sighs> Unfortunately, I didn't get one killed, but I did get a lot of footage of bears and I got really, really close. So you guys are going to have to check it out. And now we have Michael's fishing corner. Welcome back to the fishing corner. <laughs> Just got back from Fort Peck last weekend. We had a smallmouth derby in which my team won, but not because of me partially because of my girlfriend Cassie catching her first smallmouth and Casey Underwood. He's got some great art. Check it out. CaseyUnderwood.com probably. I don't know. Just Google his name. But anyways, he caught like, I want to say 80% of our fish. Casey's got the big fish and they caught the most fish in their boat. They and smallest fish. Way to go. Biggest fish, smallest fish, and the most fish. <laughs> How does it feel? And the winner of today's... <laughs> First annual smallmouth derby. How does it feel? It it feels good. Yeah. Uh, first first win. Feels good for the team. Been a tough year. Um, How was your teammates? Were you happy with your teammates? Yeah. It started off pretty rough. I'm going to be honest. It was pretty rough. But they caught on. They did well. Yeah. Uh, swapped out a lot of a lot of rigs. Well, congratulations <laughs> on your first win. Are you, are you ready for a champagne shower? Uh, yeah. I don't. <laughs> We didn't really do well on the walleyes, unfortunately, out there. It was a good time. It was weird having a tiny little John boat out in the middle of some big swells, so that made for some interesting times. But besides that, fished a little bit this week. Went fishing last night uh, at a bass pond and proceeded to forget my tackle box. So that was great. Today will be day 81, so I'm making some progress on the 200-day goal. And uh, probably we'll be doing some trout fishing uh, this weekend. We got runoff, so a lot of the free stones and like the Gallatin, a lot of the rivers around here are super blown out. We've got a ton of weather in the past week. There's a few areas where we can go fishing, and uh, we'll check in with you next week. Back to you, Marcus. <laughs> Jump into some news. The Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership posts on their website all the time. They have a blog. It's one of the first places I go to look at news stories uh, on things that I care about. And Madeline West just had a great summary blog post up on the website about a pilot project that the United States Department of Agriculture is putting on on protecting migration corridors on private land. Um, so we love to recreate and hunt on public lands, but we'd be foolish to ignore the role of private lands in conserving habitat and resources of wildlife. So this pilot project is gonna start out in Wyoming, in which they're gonna use these existing programs with more dedicated funding and a focused approach to attempt to conserve private lands with an emphasis on big game migration corridors. So basically the USDA is gonna pay and incentivize landowners to conserve their land in various ways, uh, such as preventing agriculture land from being developed into a subdivision or a mine or a solar farm, or they might try to restore farm ground back to grassland or incentivize landowners to keep grasslands intact. Or they could pay a landowner to manage their land through invasive weed control or removal of trees that are encroaching on grasslands or sagebrush lands or things such as restoring aspen stands. So it's a pretty cool project. It's basically reallocating existing programs but with a kind of focused goal on preserving the migration corridors. Wyoming is the natural 
natural place to start because there's been so much focused research and effort in understanding these migration corridors. So they're going to start there, see how it goes. Um, be interesting to follow along and, and see how this new program works. Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. Come on, man. More drama. We got more drama within the state. Why? Why does this keep happening? But anyway, numerous reports are coming in of people receiving Montana deer and elk tags that weren't supposed to receive them. 1,200 non-resident combo licenses were printed out and mailed to hunters who had chosen to have a refund if they didn't draw their desired limited entry permit. So if you're not familiar with Montana's license system, it's complicated, but here's a simplified explanation of what happened. Basically, FWP accidentally issued an additional 1,200 deer and elk tags on top of what was already established in their season setting. This is already following FWP's previous mess up where they messed up the limited entry elk draw for a coveted elk unit, which was resolved, they say, by giving out an additional 10% permits for those who were excluded from the draw. So. We've already given out more elk tags and now they already get, they gave out these extra elk tags. But anyway, FWP responded and informed the affected individuals that those permits are not valid. I'm really curious to see how this uh, shakes out in the hunting season because there's going to be an inevitable interaction between a game warden and one of these not valid permit holders. And how is that going to go? I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. An update on the lawsuit that was filed against FWP from the United Property Owners of Montana. A coalition of sportsmen's group has filed to intervene in the case on behalf of FWP and the citizens of Montana. So if you need a refresher, the lawsuit in question, UPOM, the United Property Owners of Montana, is suing FWP for not following the elk management plan, which is the plan that hasn't been updated since 2005. According to the plan, the state is 50,000 elk over objective. But with mixed property ownership, it's very difficult to get public access to those elk. So the groups that filed to intervene, Helena Hunters and Anglers, Hellgate Hunters and Anglers, Montana Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, Montana Bow Hunters Association, Montana Wildlife Federation, Public Land Water Access Association, Skyline Sportsmen, they all got together and formed this coalition to intervene in the lawsuit. The reason that they felt it necessary to intervene is the fear that FWP will just lay down and not put up a solid defense due to the current political climate and leadership within the state. So, this is far from over. We'll be following it closely and uh, we're gonna see how it all shakes out. So I saw Go Hunt posted about this on their news section and it's pretty cool. The Bureau of Land Management put together an online portal where you can nominate BLM lands that have access issues. So they put together this interactive map. It's super user friendly. You go in, you draw a polygon around the section in question and then note what access issues it has. They have a drop down menu of various options. Kind of cool. It's just a streamlined way to identify the chunks of land that have these access issues. Uh, it shows previous, previously nominated chunks as well. So you can already see what has been nominated in the past. Um, it's, it's, I'm sure a lot of the big issues, the big chunks of property that have no access are already known, but it's kind of a good way to gauge what the interest is in, in these areas. So you can go to this website that I'll link in the description and you can nominate chunks of land. The only thing is that they are requesting that it is 640 acres or more. So they want a full section of land, which I get. They want to, you know, prioritize high acreage, but sometimes a 640 acre chunk of land is much less productive than a 320 acre chunk of land, uh, depending on the wildlife's use or the recreation potential. But I get it, they gotta filter out stuff somehow. Anyway, check the portal out, it's really cool. Links in the description, helps BLM identify areas of interest. The Department of Interior announced policy and organizational update to advance clean energy on public land. One of the big changes in this update is to reduce rents and fees for wind and solar projects, essentially subsidizing and incentivizing those types of projects on public land. Much of the rhetoric in the press release was government officials kind of behind the announcement focusing on creating jobs, increasing our energy security, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So from a hunter's perspective, I look at this and it makes me wonder how is this going to impact the public lands we like to hunt on, our access to them, and the wildlife that live on them. So a solar farm takes significant space and restricts all public access, uh, basically destroys all wildlife habitat. Wind farms leave some surface open to wildlife and occasionally access, but it creates more disturbance and kills a lot of birds and bats just physically through the turbine spinning, which can have a rippling effect on an ecosystem. 
So I get it, we need energy, yes. But I think people get tunnel vision sometimes and we focus on these green energy and clean energy projects without realizing all of the other consequences. There's never a perfect solution. There's always gonna be an impact on the resource. And I think sometimes people think that Green energy is just like this perfect solution. And yes, we reduce our fossil fuel use, which is good, but there's a lot of consequences still whenever you're gonna have an energy development. Um, I'd love to see more things that happen, such as incentivizing wind farms over cropland or incentivizing solar panels on top of buildings where you have this multi-purposed approach. But again, this is one of those things that I'm not educated on. I don't know much about it. I'm sure there's still considerations with what public land they choose to use and try not to degrade prime wildlife habitat and have some sort of balance. But it still kind of bothers me that all the rhetoric is focused on how much better this is gonna be for the environment without telling the full story of all the other consequences. So those are a few of the news stories that I found interesting this week. We are skipping the deeper dive this week. Uh, we will be back next week. We'll have more to talk about. But for now, this is it. Thank you for watching. If you have anything you want to share with us, any news stories, any insight, email us at weekly at freshtracks.tv.